Hello, everyone. The title of today's presentation is Mechanisms to Improve the Productivity of Large Scale Development Team. I'm Hidenori Takeshita, Engineering Manager at Dev Development One Line, Fukuoka. Here is the agenda for today. First of all, I'd like to introduce the team that I belong to as a manager, the team that set the stage for the improvement I'm going to talk about today. Next, I will talk about some of the challenges I face there. Then, I'll talk about how I apply the improvements to the team to address those challenges. Finally, summary and future challenges. Now, let me introduce the team. Line client application that our team is in charge is being developed at five global branches, and there are approximately 200 client engineers involved both for iOS and Android applications development. As I mentioned at the beginning, I am a member of Line Fukuoka. As of January 2021, Line Fukuoka is Line's second base operation in Japan, with a total of 87 engineers, 57% of whom are from overseas. There are about 13 iOS and Android client engineers of various nationalities in the team I work for. In that team, I am in charge of a part called Shop, among many functions in Line client application. This part mainly deals with the products that u s e s that u s e r can purchase to facilitate communication, such as stickers, emoji, and themes. In 2017, I took over shop development from Tokyo. At the time, the team size was five people, including myself, but it grew to 13 people in the next four years. At the time of the team's inception, I was a plain manager doing a development also as an iOS engineer, but as the size of the team expanded, the ratio of manager work increased, and now I'm mostly focused on management. To give you an idea of the development flow, the Line Client app uses two weeks release train, with each part of the app working together with the planners, QA managers, managers and other related parties to ensure stable and continuous release of the final app. We, the Shop Client team, are also working with development teams and stakeholders around the world to meet the release every two weeks. Now, let's talk about the challenges we faced in the team that grew in this way. The following is a blue bullet list of the main issues. From top to bottom, who to ask for code reviews? Implementation differences between iOS and Android, Android have become a technical debt. Outage has increased. Struggling with new members onboarding, knowledge is dependent on the individual, no documentation or outdated. Perhaps some of you are struggling with similar issues. In addition, some of those issues are not immediate problems but gradually affect the team or issues unavoidable when expanding a team. For example, we had always been aware of the unevenness in business knowledge and the lack of documentation, but we had been too busy to prioritize them and had to put them off without discussing any particular improvement plan as a team. As we do this, it will eventually come to us as a big problem to avoid outage. And while we are busy dealing with the outage, the objects Projects were processing, so we were stuck in a loop of not being able to face the improvements. Too busy with my day to day work, I was not doing what I should have done for the team from a mid term, long term perspective, and as a result, we were facing various problems. I thought this was a failure of management to misjudge the priorities of the issues to be solved as a team, and that the manager was the bottleneck of the team's growth. In the book Radical Candor by Kim Scott, which I refer to a lot in my work as a manager, he says something like My advice is you schedule at least two hours for think time every day and hold it sacred. I was in complete agreement with this, but I couldn't afford it. So, what was keeping me so busy? What was the nature of that business? At the time, 
As a manager, I was the point of contact with other departments and was responsible for primary communication for most of the project. It was fine when there were a few people from other departments involved, but when we keep the same system despite increasing a number of other departments involved, like the planner and QA people, communication and meeting were reconcentrated on me, which became the reason why I was so busy. Then I'll have to ask everyone to share my task, but I wasn't motivated and I put it off. Why was that? To put my thoughts in perspective, firstly, I was worried about whether the members can do well, and that worry could be divided into two categories. The first thing I was worried is that whether I can trust their, their skills. This is not only technical skills, but also about overall skills in carrying out work, including communication. The other issue is language. At our company, we have bots that interpret for us on Slack and other chats, and we also have dedicated interpreters to help us at meetings, so we have a plenty of support. Even so, it can be hard not to be able to communicate in your favorite language. I can understand that. Another worry is that they may not actually want to do much of this kind of communication in the first place, as it often takes a lot of time and effort. These concerns, I thought, tend to be solved by the It's faster if I do it myself mentality that so called managers trend to tend to fall into. And that's exactly what I happened to me. I had been passing them by with the short sighted notion that I should just take care of everything. However, by monopolizing communication in this way, I would not only lose my own time but also deprive each stakeholder and team member of the opportunity to collaborate with each other, thus limiting the scope of their work. In fact, one of the things that made me realize this was our 360 degree evaluation system. This is a system where we anonymously evaluate each other's collaborators every half year, and here we can receive various feedbacks from our colleagues. At one point in the evaluation, I received feedback like this You seem to be the only one who come forward and don't let your members do their jobs. I wonder if you trust them. The comment was exactly what I had been feeling, and I renewed my thoughts that I had to do something about it. However, I can't change the system because I haven't sorted out who will take over how in the first place. As the size of the team has grown, I thought it was necessary to set up a system for the future instead of just responding on an ad hoc basis. So here's what I actually worked on. First of all, as I mentioned earlier, these issues were occurring in the team. In order to commit myself to solving these problems, I first wanted to solve the situation where the manager was the bottleneck and create a system to avoid it. In order to improve this problem, I decided to come up with a system called Component Lead System and propose it to the team in order to pass on my roles. I can That can be taken over to the members. Let me talk about the specifics. As I mentioned earlier, the shop part includes products such as stickers, emoji, themes, and the keyboard function of the talk room. We didn't have a dedicated person in charge, but rather a person who was available when there was a case to handle. I thought it would be a good idea to divide my work as the manager into different functions and delegate it to them. So I decided to assign a person in charge for each function and clarify the scope of responsibility. So, how do you divide it into different functions? In our company, we use JIRA for BTS. There are various fields in JIRA tickets, and one of them is component. This field is used to, de to define arbitrary names for each module or function, and it is also used in the lineup to clarify each function. This component has a field for setting the lead, and the person set here can be set as the default assignee for the ticket to which the component is assigned. Therefore, I decided to review and organize the shop related components and assign a lead to each of them. We also delegated the consultation for each function to this component lead. Now we can delegate the role of the contact person to the component leader for each function, which is one of the roles that the manager used to play. At the same time, the step of deciding who to assign 
based on resource status has been eliminated. We also set up a user group for each component in Slack to make it easier for people to contact each person in charge via Slack. This way, it will be easier for outsiders to contact us without knowing who is in charge. Of course, we want people to remember the name of the person in charge, but we thought it would be very convenient. Furthermore, assuming that the component lead should be knowledgeable about the implementation of the area of responsibility, I thought it would be good to have a role of code reviewer. The lead does not necessarily have to be in charge of the development of the component in question, but can distribute the load by assigning other members. The assigned members will be reviewed by the component lead, who is familiar with the implementation of the area, so they can start development with peace of mind. However, who will review the component when it is developed by the component lead themselves? In addition, the scale of each component is different, so some components are huge and generate a large amount of projects, while others are not, and the burden of code review is completely different. Therefore, I subsided the functions within a component into subcomponents and assigned a subcomponent lead to each of them. This is an original concept, not especially re related to Jira functions. The subcomponent leads, lead is then responsible for reviewing the code in that subdivision. In this way, the subcomponent lead can also act as a reviewer for the development done by the component lead. In addition, multiple subcomponent leads can be appointed to reduce the load when there are many code review tasks. For example, for the sticker component, I created six sub six subcomponents, one for logging and data sync, one for sending and receiving logic, one for stickers with movements such as animations and sounds, one for custom and message stickers that allow users to input text, and one for the functions of the settings page. I then assigned multiple subcomponent leads to those subcomponents that were particularly important or where frequent reviews occurred. Of course, there is a limit to the number of members, so some are responsible for several subcomponents with overlapping responsibilities. The component lead will be responsible for all, the, all of these areas. Next, let me talk about how to set up GitHub to automatically assign component lead and subcomponent lead as reviewers for pull requests. We will use the code owners mechanism for this. Code owners, as many of you may know, is a GitHub feature that allows you to place a code owners file under the .github directory of your repository and define it accordingly so that the defined owner of the modified file will be automatically suggested as a reviewer when creating a pull request. Specifically, by having component lead and subcomponent lead write their username with an at mark next to the name of the file in charge of, when a pull request is created with modification to the corresponding file, a reviewer will be automatically set up while the author does not have to specify an arbitrary reviewer enabling smooth review requests. Here is a flowchart describing events from when a task request is received to when the PR is reviewed. The component lead first receives the tasks, then assigns the members who would actually develop it. When the development is finished, the reviewer is automatically assigned to the component lead and subcomponent lead using GitHub's code owner feature. At the same time, a team account is set up for all files so that two or more people can review them. With this structure, implementation work could be done not only for the component in charge, which helped all members to improve their experience and understanding of the services. Since component lead or subcomponent lead, who should have sufficient knowledge of the specifications and implementation of the part, can review it, psychological burden and anxiety of the implementation of staff will be reduced and quality is ensured. Let me summarize the roles of component lead and subcomponent lead and the amount of work that each member is responsible for. The responsibilities of the component lead are as follows, communication with stakeholders, task assignment, code review of all subcomponents that the component contains. As for document management, we thought it would be a good idea to divide the responsibility among the component and subcomponent lead, which I will discuss in the details later. 
The subcomponent lead is responsible for court review and documentation management. In soliciting candidates for the position of component lead, I decided to allocate at least zero components per member because component lead has more responsibility than pure development tasks. Depending on the size of the component, competence, and motivation of the members, it is possible to take charge of more than one. On the other hand, subcomponent leaders are only responsible for code review and document management, which is what developers generally do, so each of them should be responsible for at least one of them. The settings of the tools used in the component lead system can be summarized as follows. In JIRA, set up component lead to automate and clarify the assignment JIRA tickets. In GitHub, the code owner mechanism automates and clarifies the reviewer settings. In Slack, we created user groups for each component to clarify the contact point. As a result, we have been able to delegate tasks from manager to members and establish the foundation for improving the loss of growth opportunities for members. However, I had some concerns about delegating the work. I was worried about whether the members can do well and if they would want to do this kind of work. So, I interviewed some members when the draft of the system was ready to see if there were any problems or resistance to the direction. I also made a presentation to make sure that the members understand why this was necessary and what it would solve. In addition, to avoid any discrepancies among English speakers, I asked a dedicated interpreter to the development unit to review the paper in advance for my thorough preparation. As a result of these efforts, I was very happy to see that the members were not particularly opposed to the new system but rather showed their willingness to work with it. I also asked people who wanted to be component leaders to run for the position. In my team, there are fewer members than the number of components, so we really needed one person to be in charge of multiple components, but the assignment was relatively smooth, with one person taking charge of several components that seemed to have relatively small workloads. However, given each person's experience and ability, there will naturally be differences in whether or not everybody can handle the same system to the same degree. I wanted to adjust expectations so that both managers and managed members could operate with, a, with as little stress as possible. This is where delegation poker comes in. Delegation poker is one of the practices advocated in Management 3.0, a management methodology for agile development flow. This is an activity to clarify the level of delegation between managers and members. There are levels from 1 to 7, and the higher the level, the higher the level of delegation. For example, senior engineers are expected to be level 5 or above. If both parties are clear about the scope of tasks, they will be able to clarify their expectations and ultimately make the right assessment of the other party. By the way, we have an organization called Effective Team and Delivery Department, which specializes in providing project management agile coaching throughout the company. Consulting with, the, with them is very reassuring as they can give you hints and ideas to solve such problems. If you are interested, please refer to these documents. Now, as I face the team members taking these actions, my concerns were resolved. We were able to break through the situation where manager was a bottleneck. So, we are ready to scale the normal development flow. But we had one more flow to consider delegating. Relatively large development project. To define what we meant by large scale, we are talking about a project that involves multiple teams, client server, front end, data scientist, etc. A project manager is assigned and a kickoff meeting is held. We define large as a project that takes several months to complete, such as new product development. In order to delegate the real role of the client side of such large scale projects, we create a role called project dev lead separate from component lead. 
Their responsibility include acting as a point of contact with the related parties, making technical decisions on the client side, and understanding the status of both platforms, including schedule. Compared to the component lead, the project dev lead is also responsible for some of the responsibility of the project manager. After the dev lead is selected through candidacy, nominacy, or designation, the delegation of work is agreed upon using delegation poker, which I mentioned earlier. The role of the project dev lead is to conduct three reviews as the project progresses, project review, tech review, and closing review, which I will explain about each. The first one is the project review, which is done after the project has kicked off and before the detailed design starts. In order to reduce the number of problems caused by emissions during the development of new features, in particular, we share the scope of the project's impact not only with the project stakeholders, but also with all team members, and ask for their opinions on whether there is anything missing. Specifically, the project dev lead creates a document called the project doc, which outlines the project and the expected scope of impact. Based on this document, the entire team discusses whether there is anything overlooked. Second is tech review. The first project review allows everyone to understand the big picture of the project. Next, the developers in charge of iOS and Android platforms will prepare a document on the design of implementation, which will be reviewed by the team members. This will reduce the amount of rework after the actual development has started as much as possible. Specifically, the project dev lead asks the iOS Android platform development team members to create a design doc. In many cases, the project dev lead is actually the development lead for one of the platforms. I'm not going to go deep into what a design doc is here, but it's a document that shows the basic design principles, and it's a style of documentation that's often adopted by tech companies. A company is actively adopting it. By taking this step, everyone can confirm that there are no problems in the implementation plan, and it prevents major rework after development due to problems in the design. Also, by organizing pull requests in advance, we can prevent them from getting bloated, which will reduce the burdens on reviewers and improve the quality of reviews. In addition, the problem of different API usage between iOS and Android will be addressed by having the project dev lead, taking the lead in reaching consensus among the parties involved and clearly defining API usage in the design doc that will be referenced by all platforms. The third step is a closing review. This is done when the development is completely finished and released before it leaves the project. As the development process progresses, changes, specifications often occur. The purpose of the closing review is to share the final spec and implementation and to archive the design doc. Specifically, how do we do the archive? If necessary, we will align the design doc to the final specification. Then, what is written in the document? We merge the information in the design docs that should also be included on the page with the existing specification. In addition, you can narrow down the editing permission of the page and specifically archived in the title. By doing this, people who visit this page later by searching will be able to see at a glance that the documentation is from the past when it was developed and is not currently updated and will be assured that the latest specification is compiled in the basic specification page. This eliminates confusion as to which page is trustworthy, then share the final spec its member's closing review is over. So I have explained the two mechanisms of component lead and project dev lead. With these, we have been able to handle failures, implementation differences, people dependencies, code reviews, and concerns about manager being a bottleneck to the team growth. In the next section, I will talk about measures we took to address documentation issues. The purpose of this effort is to improve the issue of onboarding and dependency on people's domain knowledge by solving or obsolete documentation issues. In order to organize the documentation, I prepare three points, searchability, criteria, or standards, and maintenance. 
how to maintain and operate them. I start from the top. In terms of searchability, we use Confluence for our wiki, and of course, you can use the search function to find the documents you want, but it's difficult to pinpoint the information you want from the huge number of documents. Another problem is that related information is not organized in a systematic way. Therefore, when creating and referring to the necessary information, we asked the question of how to reach it with less effort. I responded by preparing a portal page that defines a hierarchical structure. Documents related to the internal specification of each component are consolidated according to this hierarchical structure and by making it possible to reach the portal by first opening it when you want to refer to it. It becomes easy to access information including data information and eliminated the overhead because members no longer need to think about where to put documents when members want to write them. We have named this portal page internal docs. It may be a little hard to see, but this is the structure of internal docs. The blue box represents a single component. The green frame label main docs is a document that summarizes existing specification. iOS and Android each have their own page and each includes a common page. The main doc also includes the documentation for each subcomponent, which is shown as orange frame. The subcomponent document also has a page for each of iOS and Android and includes a common page. On the right side of the slide, the red frame is Dine Doc, which also has iOS and Android page and an included common page for each project. The light blue box is missed document where other miscellaneous documents are placed. After figuring out how component lead works and decomposing it into component and subcomponent, as soon as I decided on the structure of this document, I created all the pages of the main docs and subcomponent docs on the left-hand side as framework. This is because I thought it was important to create a place for them first, even if there was nothing inside. As I mentioned in the project Devly section, the design docs are created by the person in charge when doing relatively large-scale development and the use for tech review. After the development is complete, it is merged into the main doc and subcomponent doc during the closing review and archived. As mentioned earlier, this way the latest specification information is centralized in the main docs. You can also use the template feature of Confluence to prepare a template for each new page to reduce the burden on the person writing the documents. In particular, if you have a set of multiple pages for inclusion, you can use custom blueprint to create a multi-page template. In fact, I have not tried it yet and plan to do so in the future. I explained the first of the three points, searchability. Now let's talk about the second criteria, what to write. Some people think that writing document is not necessary because you can understand it by reading the code. However, in reality, there are many assumptions that need to be made. It is much easier to understand the code if you have various assumptions and domain knowledge beforehand. Also, when multiple people are writing the documents, there may be a problem with the quality and the granularity of documents may differ. Therefore, I think it is better to use a certain template. The most important thing is to understand the functionality of the target document, which may be a component or module. The important thing is that the information is written in such a way that the reader can build a mental model of the code group that makes up the functionality. A mental model is an image that a person has of a subject. In this section, we will introduce our case of an image of what the component or module is intended to do and how it can do it. This is our case. This is the format we defined for one component. We started with the main doc, which contains a description of what this component does, a rough release history, a definition with terms, a description of resource file used, APIs, and how to use them, as well as database design, debugging, and so on. Next, I write the documentation for the subcomponent, which is mainly diagrams. 
In particular, a class diagram and a description of each class will give you a bird's eye view of the whole process. Even in this case, a class diagram should contain the minimum necessary information, for example, only the most important methods. The class description is written in documents and you can bring in as is. Anyway, if you write about implementation that are rewritten frequently, it will be hard to maintain. Therefore, it is better to write only important processes that are not changed so easily to get an overview of the process. I have explained the second of the three points, the standard of contents. Again, the reader will be able to build an appropriate mental model. And the document that has such information will allow the readers to have the same mental model for the subject component. And even if the code is the first code that the person works on, it will affect positively the design. And also at the code review, we'll be able to reduce the rework. And also if you want to confirm the specification, you don't have to confirm the specification every time, but a code will allow you to understand. But the document must maintain the correct state, which I will talk about next. So this is about document maintenance. The first problem is that the document tends to be obsolete easily and maintenance requires cost. This is an eternal problem. To be honest, I think the answer is that you have to make time to do it. But it is also important to write information that does not become outdated easily. For this purpose, as mentioned in the section of criteria, it is important that the contents of the document is not too detailed. When writing implementation information, it is not necessary to write the same level of detail as in the code. But try to write the minimum information necessary for the reader to build a mental model. As mentioned in the component lead section, the component lead and subcomponent lead are basically responsible for maintaining the main doc and subcomponent doc of the component. If there are any changes that needs to be made to the documentation during normal development or code review, the documentation will be updated. However, if you don't have time to update the documents, you can open a ticket and register it as a task. Then periodically create a time to focus on document maintenance. This is called a maintenance week, during which you can check the documents and update them if necessary. Also, if there are any tickets that have accumulated, we'll do our best to handle them here. We haven't actually tried this yet. We are planning to hold the first meeting next month and hope to take a week or so to do it every six months. So I introduced three points about document management. First, searchability. By defining the structure of the document, they're providing a portal page. We have created a structure that allows people who want to read, write the documents to get to where they want to go without getting lost. Next, the criteria, what to write. The information should be such that the reader can build an appropriate mental model of the subject. We are also careful not to go into too much detail for maintainability. I mentioned the idea of having component leaders and subcomponent leaders manage the existing specification documents and inspect them all at the same time every six months during so-called maintenance week. Now I've gone on with my long explanation. We are now on our way to addressing all these issues. So I'd like to look back on what we talked about today. As a manager, I have been in charge of the team for several years and I have faced main challenges. In response to these challenges, I have introduced three major initiatives that we are working on today. In the component lead system, I talked about how we delegated work from managers to team members using delegation poker and tips on Jira, GitHub, and Slack. In Project Dev Lead, I talked about the three reviews to prevent rework and failures before they occur and share knowledge among members and also touched on the design doc. In documentation, I talked about portal page with a defined structure to improve searchability, then about document content standards with the goal of building mental models, and then about maintenance weeks as an idea of how to maintain them. I hope that all of these measures will be closely interwined and create a foundation for solving issues. 
Although we have only been operating the system for about three months, the number of documents has been steadily increasing, and I have seen that each component in member is taking the initiative in handling tasks. So, I feel good response. We are also seeing some action items for the future. First of all, we are going to modularize the code base to match the component. This will help clarify the scope of responsibility of each deed in the code. Next, I think it will be better to have a review process for document descriptions as well. We are considering whether it will be possible to create a system that would not require too much work. This is only for iOS at this moment, but we would like to build documentation using the DocC and Documentation Compiler feature announced by Apple at WWDC this year, and we would like to try various ways to make them coexist with wikis. Then there is analysis. We need to analyze how many tasks are actually generated by each component after the system is put into operation and control the number of subcomponent needs by increasing or decreasing the number of depending on the load. We hope to eventually create a mechanism for this load balancing. In the future, I would like to introduce the progress of the actual operation at another time. In closing, I'd like to conclude by quoting Tim Scott one more time. Did the measures I took reduce my workload as a manager and give me more time to think, as Kim said, is still difficult because we still Less work for me. I have to pay more attention to the activities of the members, help them if necessary, and observe the situation. But at least I don't think I'm the bottleneck anymore. This concludes my presentation. I hope that our team's experience will be useful for you. Thank you very much for your attention today.